Well, good morning, Internet. How is everyone today? Well, I guess you'd say good morning or good afternoon or even later in the day, depending on where you are. We've got some great friends from all over the world who are part of this every single time we show up. So thank you so much for that. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Solve Live. My name is Jeff Deverter. I am the Chief Technology Evangelist here at Rackspace Technology. And in these sessions, if you're aware, you know that uh, we, we strive to bring you the information that you need of what's going on in the tech world and why it's important to you. Now, in today's session, we have, uh, well, I've got an old favorite coming on board. I'm going to save that announcement for just a minute. But uh, I would encourage you to introduce yourself in the comments, whether you're on LinkedIn, whether you're on Twitter, whether you're on the YouTube. Uh, go ahead and comment down below. Tell me where you are and who you are and, uh, and what you do in technology. Now, whether you make your career in technology or not, you use it somehow. And I want to know how you're using it. I am actually going to tell you a little bitty secret here this morning. For those of you who are paying attention here on this bright and happy Tuesday, you know these fancy graphics I use? Let's see if anybody can figure out uh, how I do it. Uh, because it's a whole lot easier than you might imagine. Now, there are some equipment behind the scenes to make it happen. But here's the trick. It's a Microsoft product. I'm just using PowerPoint. PowerPoint and the power of green screen to make all of this happen, all of those lovely animations. Well, folks, uh, I told you I was going to have an old favorite back today. Now, not to say that Kent Kingery is old, but he is my old friend, uh, my friend of a long time. Let's put it that way. Uh, so Kent from Microsoft has come back. We have an incredible conversation geared up for you. You see, Kent and I, for longer than we care to admit, okay, we don't. It's not that we don't care to admit it because we put it on our resume, uh, that we uh, we spend a lot of time working and helping companies through the transformation with technology, regardless of what that transformation might be. And we have come up with four primary phases or zones or portions of cloud readiness. And, uh, and we're going to share that with you today and what that transformation actually looks like over time. All right. So with that, a reminder, here's how we do these shows. We're going to spend some time talking about This Week in Cloud. It's all of the news that you need to know uh, that happened uh, This Week in Cloud and why it's important. Actually, it's not all of it. It's just two articles. But since we do this show twice a week, we got to save some for Thursday. So we'll do that. Uh, after that, it's all about what's new in the cloud releases and why it's important to you. Then Kent is coming up on stage. And then look at that. What's on your mind in that section? That's where I want to know what's on your mind. So what questions might you have for Kent or myself that you, uh, that's, that's been bugging you as it relates to technology in some way or another, or maybe even how we pull off all this fancy tech to make these things happen outside of just PowerPoint. All right. So with that, you already saw a little hint as to what's coming. But before we get into that, let me, uh, let me say welcome to Mary. We're glad that you're here. Welcome to Hari. Glad that you're here. Satish is here. Aaron is here. Uh, guys, I'm so glad that you've taken the time to, uh, to watch this. So uh, if you have any questions, pop them in to, down there below. Think about a little bit later on the what's on your mind. I want you to stick around to the end because it's a chance for you to, uh, to get to share, well, what the heck is on your mind. So with that, let's jump into what is going on. I am pushing all sorts of the wrong buttons. Hey, there's the right ones. Let's talk about some news and what's happening. Now, the first news comes out of Salesforce. And, uh, and here's what's interesting about it. See, I've been talking, hey, Manish, glad you're here. I've been talking a lot lately and sharing either in the news or down in the what's new from the cloud providers information about how the clouds are specializing, whether that is happening at the major hyperscaler clouds, bienvenidos, uh, Ramesh, uh, or whether that's happening from new startups who are coming out with very specific offerings for very specific areas. Now, in this case, it's uh, obviously it's all about Salesforce. And what Salesforce has done here is uh, they have come out with a new healthcare cloud. And it's all part of Dreamforce that's going on right now. 
And their intent in being the world's leader, as they might say, in CRM and keeping up after customers and contact information, almost sounds like contact tracing, doesn't it? Well, and kind of it is, because starting here and announced at Dreamforce is a whole app for managing healthcare and not just managing, you know, not necessarily from a, hey, I'm going to my doctor point of view, but more from helping companies or or cities or whatever else, you know, keep track of who's been, in this case, vaccinated. Uh, hey, New Braunfels, so, uh, you're at the uh, New Braunfels Smokehouse? Wow, that's impressive, Arturo. Um, sorry, really distracted. For those of you not from Texas, New Braunfels Smokehouse is awesome. Look it up online. You'll be very impressed. Order something from them. So but back to Salesforce, their healthcare, uh, it's all about how do they help uh, businesses? How do they help cities? How do they help townships? How do they help anybody really keep up with what's happening in the COVID space and keep their people ultimately healthy? Now, that's a pretty good thing. All right, let's move on a little bit and now talk about a new study out of Equinix. Now, Equinix, as you're probably aware, is one of these interchanges and, and data center environments that help connect the world, literally uh, literally connects the world with their fiber. Now, Equinix did a study and the study was, you know what, regardless of what's happening in the cybersecurity realm, and there are a lot of concerns there. I've talked about it over the past few weeks. I even talked about Nicole Perloff's book that everyone needs to go order from She's a New York Times author, been covering cybersecurity for the past 10 years. It's fantastic. Uh, but in, in this case, even though cybersecurity threats continue to rise, what this, this study actually found was the fact that uh, the cloud migrations continue to move in force. In fact, as I look at the information, they grew from 15% of businesses saying they were doing it the previous year to this year, now 37% involved in some sort of cloud migration. Now, Kent Kingery, you can tuck that in your pocket and save it for our conversation as we talk about in a minute all the different types of migrations that can occur. So that's really interesting. All that continues. Now, the last number I'll give you there is by their estimation, as I look over here at my notes, um, there is, uh, most companies still say that they're only 48% moved out into the cloud. Can you believe that? All of this transformation over all of these years, still only 48% still in the cloud. Uh, all right. So with that, let's um, move on to uh, cloud releases and what's new from our good friends over at the cloud providers. Now it starts with, uh, we always start with AWS and, uh, and they've got a new offering around uh, builds for uh, startups, for companies, for startups starting their businesses and utilizing AWS as their infrastructure provider. Now, there's a bunch of Terraform, uh, a bunch of CloudFormation templates uh, that help uh, in architectural patterns to help get the core infrastructure foundation in place for new businesses. So this is super interesting. You can head over to AWS to learn more about that. Also from AWS is, uh, you know, they've had, um, of course, Redshift for a good long time, but now they've got an RSQL, a command line interface for inter interacting with Redshift. Uh, clusters. Now, this is interesting because what it continues to do is show this refinement in capability from the cloud providers. Now, we'll find this from Azure and from Google here just in a second as well, because what we have is it, all these announcements are more than just from a week by week basis, new features and capabilities, but it's an expansion geographically and it's an expansion technically and from a capability perspective. And I think that's really, really interesting. Now, as we move over into, uh, into Azure, in public preview, we've got group management scopes for uh, Azure reservations. Now, what they're focused on here over at Microsoft is helping you do a couple of things. First one, save money. That's what reservations are all about. Now, we're talking about reservations. We're talking about either some really expensive storage or we're talking about virtual machines. Now, virtual machines, as Kent will tell us in a second, still have a place in our world of cloud native, um, very specific use cases. And, uh, and when you need a big honking VM or your application is one that doesn't necessarily necessitate an upgrade uh, and something you just kind of want to ride out and leave it in VMs, well, you can reserve those VMs and say, hey, look, we're, we're buying these on the year and you'll get a much better price on it. But now you can actually have them created and put directly into management groups 
uh, as well to help pick up all the policies and the things that a management group is going to give you. Now, also from uh, from Azure is the general availability. Now, as I was looking at the news from Azure this week, what I realized is most of the news was, and I've only listed one of them here, is capabilities that already existed, but now in new regions. And just like all the cloud providers, Azure, when they launch a new service, they will put it in a very specific location, uh, a couple of locations, their key ones where they have center of gravity of customers, and then let it you know spread out to the rest of the data centers. So uh, archival storage is now available in three new regions. Uh, you can see them listed here in Europe. And that's pretty uh, pretty awesome because now we have more capabilities. It allows you to move your workloads all over the world and have that capability. Over at Google, uh, Anthos clusters on bare metal for uh, release 1.7.4. Again, an enhancement and a continued growth of the uh, of uh, of in this case Anthos being provided by Google uh, for when you want to run those Google based workloads. Uh, inside of your own data center, or maybe even out in another hyperscaler, which is certainly capable. Also, you have object versioning can now be managed through the cloud console, which is great. Uh, and what this does, and the other thing I wanted to call out here on these upgrades, is it's not just about providing you know, new regions or uh, depth of capability, but what this really shines a light on is the fact that managing your workloads, once they're moved into the cloud, it takes on a whole new, um, a whole new reality. And when, uh, when, when you do that, uh, it means that when you make that transition to the cloud, ultimately what it means is the way that you look and manage these workloads needs to happen on a moment by moment basis. You know, I'm glad to bring you a few of these upgrades that happen here on our Tuesday and Thursday show, but it's part of what your clouds, I'll call them system administrators, cloud operators need to be paying attention to because there are upgrades to be done, there are consolidations to be done, and there's new capabilities to be harnessed. All right, so that's what's going on in the cloud. And now it's, of course, my great pleasure to bring in my very good friend, Kent Kingery, known him for years and years. So let's bring him up onto the stage, producer Daniel and uh, Kent. So welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, it is. Oh, you got all formal. We were having such a good joke and a laugh here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, know, you sounded you sounded very stuffy there for a moment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I'll I'll try not to do that again. <laughs> That's right. All right. So uh, so Lee, I love that you commented and called out containers. You know, as we talked about Anthos. Uh, yes, absolutely. And containers are one of those. Kent, they are one of those those tools that can be used as we think about how we move our workloads out into the cloud. Now, Professor Carlos Roncal, thank you for the link of how to learn Spanish quickly. I certainly oh. could use it, even though I have lived in San Antonio where we are a bevy, my favorite new word, bevy of Spanish speakers. Uh, so everyone, thank you so much for interacting in the chat. And I want you to be thinking about your questions for the what's on your mind section coming up. It's your chance to engage, not just with me, but even with Kent. In fact, we used to play a game when we'd play music together. That's right. We play music uh, called Stump the Chump. And uh, I want you to be thinking about, you know, you say, hey, play this song. Do you know it? So I'd love for you to think about a, a good question for Kent. But Kent, you and I have been involved in technology for longer than well, I say we care to admit, but it's on our resumes. And uh, uh, but what we were talking about yesterday is the transformation out to the cloud really does take a few and we've defined it as four key waves or eras or periods in your transformation. And, uh, and we kind of drew it back to back in 2012 when the marketers first used that beloved of phrase is uh, digital transformation. You know, they saw a new tool and a new toy and came up with a new word and, you know, they thrust it upon us. And I hated it then because it made no sense, but it makes perfect sense now, but that's an argument for another day. Well, they, that's put it on, they put it on a label, right? And they stuck it on every product they had, on every on every uh, webinar, on every uh, seminar that you went to, every conference had this whole transformation label on it. And they nobody did. knew what it meant. They did. No. In fact, you know, the marketers would come and knock on my door and say, hey, can you do a digital transformation webinar? I said, absolutely. But what's digital transformation? Because all I see is us moving data centers and that's not very exciting. Yeah. But that does define that first phase of move, infrastructure modernization. Why don't you walk us through that? 
Well, so so we we think of it, it, it essentially as cloud hosted, and it is data center migration, right? It is the picking up of your essentially your entire data center, or even large portions of it, and moving it into some sort of cloud hosting environment, whether that is a hyperscaler like Azure or Google or AWS, or whether it's private cloud like a Rackspace data center, right? Because you and I spent quite a bit of time talking about that yeah. as well, but it but it is essentially a rehost. Um, it, it's a lift and shift. You get some great benefit from it. You get disaster you recovery. You get high availability. You get the ability to um, to, to start to deal with um, a, a, a regular subscription licensing as opposed to perpetual licensing. Um, and there's and there's a huge uh, a, a jump in security capabilities as well. But you are still doing the same thing you were doing over in your data center in somebody else's data center. That's right. And in some cases, you know, you pick up one or two as a services that make life a little easier. Like if you're moving to Azure, you might, instead of moving an Active Directory server, you might migrate into Azure Active Directory or use some SQL, you know, uh, Azure SQL or, you know, some of the Redshift we talked about from AWS before. But it, but but that really does now start to talk about, hey, Amesh, glad that you're here. But that really does start to talk about what that phase two looks like. And that's when we start to pick apart these applications because that move to the cloud isn't, just because you're in the cloud doesn't mean you're cloud D. So let's talk about that phase two and what that looks like. So now we're thinking about cloud ready, right? The, right? the ability for us to take advantage of, as you said, the the stronger features of the cloud, and we're starting to move toward that nirvana, that last phase. Um, we might have some DevOps in here. Uh, we might finally start to break apart our application and decouple pieces of the application from the traditional infrastructure that we've used. We still have probably a, a fairly significant IaaS component, uh, infrastructure as a service, Service, but now we're moving on to things like database as a service or, or platform as a service. And this is where containerization that, that Lee points out really comes into play. The idea that we're breaking up the applications and we're starting to put them into contained parts that are manageable. Right. This is also where you start to see people really get interested in things like cost management, cost optimization, uh, compliance um, you know, around their cloud environment, and even down to something like cloud native network which they really haven't looked at up to this point. Super interesting. Yeah. And so, and so you used a phrase in there as well, or a word in there, and that of course was DevOps. And, and that speaks to, you know, we're able to do that because we're writing on this infrastructure that is software addressable as opposed to, you know, physical servers we might have had to deal with before. Well, and uh, you guys have a great, a great program on uh, DevOps, and I don't have the link handy. Maybe uh, producer Daniel can dig it up. But there's a great conversation that you guys had around DevOps. I think it's perfect for anyone trying to understand that, uh, that approach and that need when you move to cloud. Awesome. But it, but it does speak to the change in not just the technology, but the way, the process uh, that that work happens and the people and their skills. Maybe, maybe address that just a second. Well, I think it goes back to my favorite phrase. You've heard it, me say it a thousand times. Cloud is an operating model. Right. Part of that operating model is dealing with the standard people, process, and technology issues. Notice that technology is way down there toward the end. Now you've got to basically reskill your people. If they were, and here's a simple one: if they were used to running down the hallway to look at the rack of servers to see if the blinky lights are going, they don't have that luxury anymore because those servers and and that that compute power is totally somewhere else, might be on the other side of the globe. And so there's that. There's also the willingness to rethink um, uh, how an application or a solution really is deployed, uh, created, et cetera. And so there's a lot of, of I would say upskilling. Um, if, if you go out to Google now and search upskilling as a term, there's a whole raft of study and, and, and research around this and how we get our people at that point. Got it. All right. So perfect. So that really gets us into that second, into that second zone. 
Um, but as we now start to think about the third phase, the third wave of transformation, what we're doing now is we're starting to truly go cloud native. We're taking and now breaking those VMs up. And by that, I mean, we're going into the applications that ride on those VMs and reimagining how they might work. Now, earlier on, we talked about examples where we might go grab some, some SQL as a service or identity as a service. But at this point, we're making a very purposeful move into taking those apps apart, usually piece by piece, you know, function by function and putting them into, well, in the case of Azure, Azure Functions or whatever your serverless flavor is in the cloud of choice or regrouping them up in, into containers. Yep. So so maybe talk about some of some of that process and the tech involved there. Well, I think the thing that's that's really key to point out here is that now you're basically enabling uh, cloud usage in a way that you were not in the first two phases of your journey. Right. Um, you're really bringing in. So let's take containers as a great example. It's one thing to take a container and just run it on Docker on a server somewhere. You get a lot of advantage out of that, right? The ability for you to sort of uh, you know migrate your workload around to different things. But once you get to sort of this cloud cloud enabled phase, you're really talking about things like orchestration, things like being able to bring in not only DevOps, but DevSecOps. So now you've brought the security piece into it as well. Right. Uh, you're now into environments that really could be considered um, uh, somewhat self-healing, right? And then there is the the really the thing that we're moving you know closer and closer and closer to it being a, a, a sort of a standard thing, and that's AI ops, the mm. ability for us to take these artificial intelligence engines and capabilities and apply that to our operations, so that we're largely letting the computer do what the computer does, compute does, which is mundane sort of pedestrian, you know, sort of predictive tasks, and it frees our human beings up to go do things that humans are really good at. So that's sort of typical of what this phase is. Yeah, now you're really getting us into that fourth phase and, and the lines really do blur in that case. Oh, yeah. And that's where you're taking, and you've not just broken your application up. You're not just utilizing a transactional based capabilities beyond your reservation based um, capabilities. Now what you're doing is we've, we've, we've moved it into the transactional mode, but now we're starting to consume all the other things that are there. I was using, everyone, I was using the example earlier. Uh, I, I really like coffee and I live by the uh, by the, the method or the, the mantra that anything worth doing is worth overdoing. So because I love coffee, it means I also roast my own coffee. Now I've learned a lot about roasting coffee and there are two primary phases of roasting coffee. The first is what we'll call an endothermic reaction where we just keep applying heat to the coffee to get it to this roasting point. But if you take it a little bit too far, like when you get to that French roast mode, um, what's starting to happen is you get to the point of it being an exothermic. In other words, we don't have to, we're now putting, we're now getting out more heat than what we're putting in. We're actually starting to burn the bean a little bit. But when we now take and trans transition back to the cloud conversation, we're getting more, we have the ability now to get more out of the cloud than what we put into it. We're now able to get immeasurably more out of our data because it is now so interconnected, because it can now be connected to new services, the AI that fits into this, the machine learning that fits into this, the insights that fit into this, the, the ability to even uh, effectively for a couple of bucks, or in some cases, a couple of cents, play what if, as opposed to for a couple of hundred thousand dollars in half a year, play what if. So Kent, right. your thoughts on this, this cloud nirvana. Yeah. So, so the, it's the big I at this point, right? It's innovation. You know, we yeah. talk about innovation. We talk about the cloud enabling innovation, but, but at this fourth phase, in, in my opinion, is really where the innovation capability starts to take over. And as you said, sometimes it's a cost thing. Sometimes it's an ease thing. The ability to just spin something up for 30 seconds and test a theory and then spin it back down again, that's almost impossible. Even in the best run virtual environments in kind of phase one. Very, very difficult to accomplish till you get here. Uh, you're now trying to get to and probably approaching true microservice architecture. You've probably yeah. gotten to pieces of it before, but now you're thinking of that as sort of a, of a, of a first port of call as opposed to an afterthought. Um, this is also where low code and no code start to yeah. come in. So from a Microsoft perspective, that's Power Platform. Uh, you know, the things that we can do with Power Apps, et cetera. 
cetera. And there's an ability there to sort of free yourself from the trappings of those first three phases. And then finally, you are now at a point where I think you can start to really look at what we, at the word we started with, which is transformation. Yes. Transforming the experience of not only your end customers, your end users, think of a bank or think of an insurance company, stodgy old industry that's now completely revamping the way a user interacts. But just as importantly, you're transforming how your internal people view it. That's right. You're giving them better tools, better capabilities, better insight. And now all of a sudden, a lot of the, again, the pedestrian sort of mundane stuff goes away and they focus on innovation. So innovation, transformation together. That's right. You're at that point of cloud nirvana where you truly can not just transform, you know, your your infrastructure and your tech, but your now everything that's that affects your business both externally and internally right. is now on the table. All right, folks, we are not seeing a lot of questions for Kent. The stump the chump game is not going to be quite as much fun, but that just means that I get to uh, to really cede the floor to Kent because what what I'll ask Kent is I'll just ask him what's on your mind? You know, what's on your mind as we think about tech, as we think about cloud, maybe in light of our previous conversation, or maybe not. So really at this point, the floor is Ken Kingery's our, our, uh, from Microsoft. I, so it's a, it's a great question. And I've, I thought a lot about um, the conversations you and I've had over the last several weeks and months and even years. And I think we are finally turning the corner on technology becoming the enabler mm. rather than the goal. Um, it is interesting to me that the, um, that the real issue behind cloud adoption, cloud transformation is often focused solely on the technology. What to focus solely on how do we get a VM there? How do we move from a VM to a, to a serverless application? How do we move from a serverless application to something else? And we're so focused on cloud as a thing that we have forgotten that the whole reason we're doing this is to improve our business. And so now we're finally at a point where a lot of that can be um, sort of, uh, I almost hesitate to use this word, but democratized. So and mm -hmm. I, you and I have talked a lot about low code, no code, right? The ability for us to take somebody who has business domain expertise, an accountant, a, uh, an insurance, you know, uh, adjuster, uh, you know, a, uh, an oil and gas, you know, engineer, and be able to put the tools in their hand to be able to take what they know about their domain, their problem domain, and build systems that help them go solve the problems in that domain. Um, think back way, 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 way back when Ashton Tate um, introduced DBase. Remember that? So oh, wow. DBase went into the hands of people who had never programmed before. And all of a sudden, even a, a real estate broker or something like that could build a system, uh, DOS based, you know, with data that would allow them to do joins and things that the big boy database guys did. And they could right. do it for 495 bucks. And now we're at that place again. We are, uh, and then some. All right, Kent, always a delight to have you on the program. Thanks so much for taking the time to do it, for uh, dialing it. in from the Death Star as I look at your background. Uh, <laughs> it really does look like General Palpatine yeah. should be back there somewhere doing something really bad. I think they're uh, happy now. Yeah, everyone, thanks so much for being a part of this. We will, of course, be back on Thursday at 8.30 Central Time. Thank you, Christine, for your comments. Tariq, thanks for keeping us honest on the, the flow of the video. And, uh, oh, hey, Paul Graham, always uh -oh. in here. Uh -oh. Let's answer Paul's question. Uh, does specific functions from hyperscalers drive lock-in? How do you avoid this? Uh, all right. So here, I'm going to give you my answer, Kent, as a, as a no. hyperscaler. So my answer no. is embrace the lock-in. Um, that's actually what you want. Not that you, what you really want is to be able to have those capabilities um, that those the, the microservices entail. If you're truly worried about lock-in, if you truly think they're out to get you, Use containers and then throw all your your uh, your bits into there. Kent, anything you'd add to that? I, I the only thing I would add here is exactly that there are ways to avoid the lock in process. But I have been advising customers for years. Mm -hmm. it, when you think about cloud, especially a public hyperscaler, pick a major, just like you did in college. Pick a major. You know, pick the primary one you're going to use and go all in. 
yeah. pick a secondary one so that you have a backup, uh, so that you have a place to retreat in case you need to, and then pick your tertiary clouds to do specific functions. Maybe it's AI and machine learning, maybe it's something else. And the thing I will tell you is, is that for almost every capability you will find in a cloud, there is an agnostic way to go about doing it that does not lock you in. And uh, obviously, you know, it, it, there, are, there are plenty of approaches, but I think lock-in can be avoided. I don't think it's a worry anymore. Yep. Okay. Excellent advice. And that's another topic we could spend a whole oh lot of time gosh, on. Yes. Everyone, thanks so much. My name is Jeff Deverter. I'm the Chief Technology Evangelist here at Rackspace Technology. We bring these live sessions to you every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, at 8.30 Central Time. Thanks so much for being a part of this today. We've got a great program scheduled for uh, for you on Thursday. Watch the Rackspace feed coming up uh, tomorrow for more information about the guest. So, Amesh, Paul, everyone, thanks for the great feedback. Yeah. I hope this has been helpful. By the way, these are always available. If you can't make the 8.30, uh, can't get your questions in, you can watch them anytime throughout the day. We're reposting clips all the time anyway. So, Kent, as always, thank you so much. Everyone, have a great day. Go make a difference in whatever it is that you do at your business. See you.